studying his existence in left-bank cafes. The name existentialism has a curious history. After being inadvertently invented by Kierkegaard, it was forgotten, then revived by the Germans, then disowned. Both Husserl and Heidegger refused to be called existentialists, rejecting this tag on the grounds that it limited and trivialized the scope of their philosophy. Sartre, who had no qualms about his philosophy being limited or trivial, was the first to call himself an existentialist in the early 1940s. By the end of the decade, it had made him world famous, and the name became virtually synonymous with his own. Sartre acknowledged that Kierkegaard had played a role in the early development of existentialism, but insisted that his existentialism had nothing to do with Kierkegaard's. This is grossly unfair, but much as Kierkegaard would have wished it. Sartre's promiscuity and atheism, both of which played a major role in his philosophic life, could have had no part in Kierkegaard's philosophy. From Kierkegaard's Writings The first thing to understand is that you do not understand. Journals At birth we set sail with sealed orders. Journals The more a man is able to forget, the greater number of transformations his life can undergo. The more he is able to remember, the more divine his life becomes. Journals, 429 When I am dead, no one will discover among my papers a note which contains the key to my life. This is a consolation to me. No one will discover the words which explain everything, and which often make what the world would consider a trifle into an event of tremendous significance for me, or what I consider to be utterly unimportant once it has been stripped of its protective gloss. Journals, 431. The purpose of my life would seem to be to express the truth as I discover it, but in such a manner that it is completely devoid of authority. By having no authority, by being seen by all as utterly unreliable, I express the truth, and put every one in a contradictory position where they can only save themselves by making the truth their own. Journals, 432. At each forward step philosophy sloughs a skin, and these then become inhabited by useless hangers-on. Journals. If Hegel had completed his logic and then said in the preface that the entire thing was merely an experiment in thought, where he had even made a number of unwarranted assumptions, then he would definitely have been the greatest thinker of all time. As it is, he is merely a joke. Journals When we consider the question of truth in an objective manner, our thought is directed objectively to the truth, and this is considered as an object to which the thinker is related. However, our thought is not concentrated on the relationship, but instead on the question of whether it is the truth to which the thinker is related. If the object to which he is related is the truth, he is reckoned to know the truth. When we consider the truth in a subjective manner, our thought is concentrated subjectively on the nature of our relationship, i.e. not on that to which it is related. If this relationship itself is a true one, we subjectively know the truth, even if the actual object of this relationship is untrue. Concluding Unscientific Postscript Subjectivity, inwardness, is the truth. This is my thesis. Concluding Unscientific Postscript Philosophy is quite right when it maintains that life must be understood backward, but one forgets the other principle, that it must be lived forward. When one analyses this latter principle, one inevitably comes to the conclusion that life in time can never be properly understood, because no moment in which one is living can acquire the complete stillness necessary to orient oneself backward. Selected Aphorisms The comical is always the mark of maturity, yet it is vital that some new emotion should be ready to sprout beneath it, and that the sheer force of comedy should not smother this growing pathos, rather it should serve to indicate that a new pathos is beginning. Concluding Unscientific Postscript Humanity all those exceptional human beings, scattered so few and far between through the centuries, have each in their time delivered judgment on humanity. According to one, man is an animal. According to another, he is a hypocrite. According to another, he is a liar, and so on. Perhaps I won't be too wide of the mark when I say he is a waffler, and encouraged by the gift of speech at that. 
With the help of speech, everyone participates in the highest, but to participate in the highest with the help of speech, and in doing so to talk nonsense, is as much a mockery as to participate in a royal banquet by being a spectator in the gallery. Were I a pagan, I would say, an ironic deity bestowed on humanity the gift of speech so as to amuse himself watching such a self-deception. Of course, from a Christian viewpoint, God bestowed the gift of speech upon humanity out of love, so making it possible for all to gain a real understanding of the highest. Oh, with what sorrow must God look down on the result! Journals, 1383 if science had been as developed in Socrates' time as it is now, the sophists and those who professed to teach philosophy would have been scientists. They would have hung microscopes outside their door to attract business, and would have put up signs proclaiming, Learn and see through a powerful microscope how humanity thinks. And on reading this advertisement, Socrates would have remarked, That is just how men who do not think behave. Selected Aphorisms Faith is an absurdity. Its object is utterly unlikely, irrational, and beyond the reach of any argument. Suppose someone decides that he wants to acquire faith. Let's follow this comedy. He wants to have faith, but at the same time he also wants to reassure himself that he is taking the right step, so he undertakes an objective inquiry into the probability that he is right. And what happens? By means of his objective inquiry into probability, the absurd becomes something different. It becomes probable. It becomes increasingly probable. It becomes extremely and utterly probable. Now this person is ready to believe, and he tells himself that he doesn't believe in the same way as ordinary men like shoemakers and tailors, but only after having thought the whole matter through properly and understood its probability. Now he is ready to believe it. But, lo and behold, at this very moment it becomes impossible for him to believe it. Anything that is almost probable, or probably, or extremely and utterly probable, is something he can almost know, or as good as know, or extremely and utterly nearly know. But it is impossible to believe. For the absurd is the object of faith, and the only object that can be believed. Concluding Unscientific Postscript the human race stopped fearing God. After this came its punishment. It began to fear itself, began to crave the phantasmagorical, and now it quakes before this creature of its own imagination. Selected Aphorisms Chronology of Kierkegaard's Life 1813. Soren Kierkegaard born in Copenhagen 1830. Becomes theology student at University of Copenhagen. 1834. Death of his mother. 1837. Meets Regine Olsen for the first time when she is fourteen. 1838. Death of his father. 1840. Becomes engaged to Regine. 1841. Breaks off engagement to Regine and leaves for Berlin. 1842. Publishes Either or. 1843. Publishes Fear and Trembling. 1844. Publishes The Concept of Dread. 1846. Becomes involved in vituperative polemic with satirical magazine Corsair. 1848. Has religious experience which changes his nature and attitude towards spreading the word of God. 1849. Publishes Sickness unto Death. 1854. Decides to embark on polemic against the Church. 1855. Founds magazine The Moment, which he fills with his own articles against the Church. April. Sees Regine for the last time before she sets sail for the West Indies. October. Collapses in the street and is taken to the hospital. Dies November the 11th. Chronology of Kierkegaard's Era. 1813. Danish state bankruptcy causes widespread ruin evaded by Kierkegaard Sr., who has his savings in gilt-edged securities. 1813. Birth of Wagner. 1815. Battle of Waterloo. British consolidate empire over whole of India. 1821. Faraday discovers principle of electric motor. 1825. Birth of the railway. Stockton to Darlington route opened by Stevenson. 1829. British annex whole of Australian subcontinent. 1830. 
Greece achieves independence from Ottoman Empire. 1831. Hegel dies of cholera in Berlin. Darwin sets sail on HMS Beagle for Galapagos Islands. 1832. Death of Goethe in Weimar. 1834. German states establish customs union, Zollverein, helping to inaugurate the Industrial Revolution in Europe. 1844. Birth of Nietzsche. 1845. Annexation of Republic of Texas by United States. 1848. A wave of revolution sweeps Europe. Mexico cedes southwestern America, including California, to the United States. 1850. The dedicated anti-Hegelian philosopher Schopenhauer belatedly achieves fame. 1853-1856. Crimean War. 1856. Birth of Freud. This concludes the reading of Kierkegaard in 90 Minutes by Paul Strathern. The book was read by Robert Whitfield. For other audiobooks from the Philosophers in 90 Minutes series, or if you would like to obtain a complete printed catalogue of our titles or our monthly update telling you about new releases and our new collection of books on CD, write to Blackstone Audiobooks, P.O. Box 969, Ashland, Oregon 97520 or call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. You may also obtain the same information from our award-winning website. Our address, all one word, is www.blackstoneaudio.com. Thank you.